The local folklore of the town of Wallaceburg in southern Ontario, Canada, tells the story of a family that was terrorized by a poltergeist in the 19th century. In this video, we'll be looking at the Baldoon mystery. The town of Wallaceburg was founded in the early 19th century. It was first incorporated as a village in 1875 and then as a town in 1896. The first settlers came to the area from Scotland in 1804 after being promised a better life by Thomas Douglas, who was the fifth Earl of Selkirk. They initially settled along the Sny River at a location that would be called the Baldoon Settlement. Life for the newcomers to the area was not easy. The settlers faced many difficulties such as malaria, lack of food and harsh winters. By the 1820s, Lord Selkirk gave up on the settlement, viewing it as a failure. But the settlers never gave up and they helped contribute to the early success and development of the town of Wallaceburg. Two of the settlers who had moved to this area to build a better life for themselves were a couple named Donald and Flora MacDonald, who came from Scotland to the settlement in 1804. The couple had a son named John, who was just six years old when the family emigrated from Scotland. In 1826, John had married a local girl and acquired a farm of his own. The particular lot that he had gotten was one that many in the area wanted. And many in the area became very bitter that they had lost the lot to the McDonald's. Some even going as far as resenting the family for it. One person who really wanted the land was an elderly woman who did not give up. She really wanted this land, and she had taken the loss of the land personally. She would approach John MacDonald many times to ask to purchase the land from him, even showing up on the family's doorstep multiple times a day to offer them money for the land. But John rejected her offer every single time. Over time, the woman's visits would become more and more sporadic before they stopped altogether. When it seemed that the woman had finally given up, the McDonald's began focusing on building their large frame farmhouse upon the land. In October 1829, the women of the family and some neighbor girls were working in the barn when a pole suddenly crashed down from the ceiling. The women first assumed that this wasn't anything strange. One of the poles that formed a loft must have simply come loose and fallen down. So they soon went back to work. Several minutes would go by, then suddenly a second pole came crashing down. This was strange and now a bit more concerned, the women started looking around but they were unable to find anything to explain why two poles had suddenly fallen. Once again, they resumed their work, and soon they would become engrossed in conversation and forgot all about the fallen poles. But then, out of nowhere, a third pole would drop from the ceiling and land dangerously close to where the women were standing. Now, the women were really scared and they were worried that the structure was about to collapse, so they immediately ran out of the barn and into the house. They couldn't have known it at that point, but this strange event was only the beginning of the torment that the family would endure for the next three years. Soon, more and more strange events would start happening. Stones would be thrown at every window, and whenever the stones were examined, the family noticed that the stones were very smooth, and in some cases they were even wet as if someone had thrown them from the bed of the river that ran right in front of the house. 
rocks and stones would be thrown at the windows so often that all of the windows of the house ended up either riddled with holes or broken and had to be boarded up. In one strange event, a guest who was visiting the farm would be hit in the chest by a stone when he was standing in the McDonald's kitchen, which left a nasty bruise. The man would angrily pick up the stone and took it back outside and then threw it into the river. He then retreated back inside the house. But only minutes after returning to the house, another stone would drop from the ceiling and land at his feet. When he picked up this stone, the man found that it was wet as if it had come from the river. The man then decided that he had enough. So he grabbed his coat and his hat and he bid his hosts farewell and left. Then there were other strange things that began happening. The roof would leak even when it hadn't rained in days. They would hear strange noises in the kitchen in the middle of the night as if someone was stomping through the kitchen wearing heavy boots. At one point, the property appeared to have been hit by what was believed to have been an earthquake. An earthquake that was so strong that it rocked the house to its foundation. But the following days after the earthquake, the McDonald's would speak with their neighbors and were shocked to learn that they were the only ones who had felt this earthquake. No one else had noticed anything. Small fires would break out all over the house. At one point, this would be observed by a man named William Fleury, who lived just up the road from the McDonald family. He claimed to have seen fire manifest in 10 different places at once. Another local resident named William Stewart would also report on the strange occurrences on a McDonald farm. He claimed to have been present when the barn had caught fire and a large stone that came from the river had been thrown right through the door. They would search the area, but they found no other person there that could have been responsible. Stewart would also speak of visiting the house at one point and seeing a loaf of bread dance across the kitchen table, completely on its own. Soon, news of these strange occurrences would spread throughout the community, and hundreds of curious people from the surrounding areas would visit the house, hoping to see some of these activities firsthand. Supposedly, the events were even reported in the Toronto Globe. Seeing this as an opportunity to make some money, the McDonald's would take advantage and allowed their farm to become a bit of a tourist attraction. But things would get even more violent after that. A. H. Drullard is someone who visited the farm in 1830 and recalled some strange occurrences. According to Drullard, a pot had risen from the hearth and started chasing a dog outside and all around the yard. And no matter how fast the dog ran, it was unable to get away from this pot that was chasing it. As long as the incidents were strange but not very dangerous, the family could live with it and try to make some money off it. But now it was getting more violent and now they started believing that everything that was happening was the work of the devil. So they would ask a local preacher, Preacher Harmon, to bless the estate. The preacher would soon show up. He walked around the farm reciting religious passages when a rock suddenly came crashing through the front door and landed right in front of him. This was enough to terrify the preacher who interpreted this rock as a warning. So as soon as he saw it, he packed up his things and left the farm. Still terrified that this was the work of the devil, the McDonald's would then ask another member of the clergy to perform an exorcism. A local Methodist preacher, Reverend McDormand, arrived to perform the exorcism. But his efforts only seemed to make things much worse. And the alleged poltergeist would now become even more violent. Livestock that were healthy would suddenly die in the middle of the night. Horses would drop dead in their stalls. An ox that the family owned would die in the middle of a field, still connected to the plow. 
their hogs and chickens would also just drop dead. And the violence did not stop with the animals. The cradle where the family's little baby slept would start rocking of its own volition. At one point, while the baby was in the cradle, it would start rocking so violently that two men had to hold the cradle to try to keep it still long enough for the mother to grab the baby out of the cradle. Guns would suddenly just go off even though no one was holding them or was anywhere near them. The small fires that had broken out previously would break out with increased frequency and became much more difficult to put out. A local resident named Lachlan McDougall was traveling up the river alongside two other men. When passing by the McDonald farm, they noticed that the house was on fire. They didn't see any movement anywhere on the farm and they realized that the family must still be unaware of the impending danger. The group then got off the boat but was stopped by another resident of the McDonald farm who asked them to help them carry out their furniture as they believed that the fire would soon spread to their house. At this point the fire was only at the McDonald house and hadn't spread to the other houses in the area. So they helped them carry out the furniture and while this was happening the McDonald's house and the barn were reduced to ashes and the family had barely escaped alive and were only able to save the clothes that they had on. The community would band together to help the McDonald's try to replenish the losses that they had suffered in the fire. The family went to live with John's brother-in-law while rebuilding their cabin. But it wouldn't be long before more fires spontaneously broke out. Fearing that these fires would affect his brother-in-law's home as well, John took his family away and sought shelter elsewhere and he soon learned that he was right in having this fear, because no matter where they went, the strange activities were never far behind. For a time, the family were forced to live a nomadic life, moving from place to place and unable to call anywhere home. But they would soon have enough and decided to return to their property. They gathered all of the old sails that they could find in the neighborhood and set up a tent as shelter. But once winter came along, the tent was freezing, and the family decided that even a cabin that was haunted was preferable to a freezing tent. So the family moved back into their cabin, and John immediately resumed all efforts to remove this poltergeist. He sought counsel from Protestant missionaries, native medicine men, and Catholic priests. Nothing worked. Sometime later, John would hear about a doctor that lived in Long Point, whose daughter was said to possess the gift of second sight. Feeling like he had nothing to lose, John decided to pay them a visit, and he was accompanied by Reverend McDormand. Upon arriving, they immediately asked to speak with the doctor's 15-year-old daughter, Dinah. It took some convincing for the doctor to agree, but he did eventually allow them to speak with Dinah. She listened to John's story and then went back to her bedroom. It would take three hours for Dinah to emerge from her room, and when she did, she was exhausted and disheveled. She told the men that in her meditations, she had learned that an old woman who lived in a longhouse wanted to drive the McDonald's away from the land. Dinah was convinced that this was the source of all the strange occurrences at the property. She then asked John a very strange question. She asked him if he had seen a stray goose wandering his farm at any point since the troubles began. John was taken aback by the question, but after thinking about it for a while, he told her that he had indeed seen a strange goose in his flock every now and again for some time. Dinah then told him that that bird was not a bird at all. It was a physical representation of the family's tormentor, the old woman who sought to drive them away from the property. She told him that the next time he saw this goose, he should shoot it with a bullet cast of solid silver. And it was very important that the bullet was silver, because lead or any other metal would do it no harm. 
She explained that this goose was tied to the old woman. So an injury to the goose will be an injury to the woman. So shoot the bird and the hauntings would come to an end. Although he still had his doubts, John felt that it was at least worth a try. So as soon as he returned home the following evening, he set about melting a piece of sterling silver into a bullet. Then he grabbed his rifle and headed outside to try to see if the goose was anywhere near. And he was in luck. When he was walking to the field, he spotted the goose. One of the reasons he always noticed this goose was because it would always try to keep its distance from the rest of the flock. As soon as he spotted the goose, he took aim and fired the silver bullet. As he took the shot, the goose moved slightly, so the bullet only tore through one of its wings. To John's surprise and horror, the goose would scream like a human woman in agony. The goose would then start running away with such speed that John struggled to keep up. At this point it was getting dark, so John decided that he would resume his hunt for the goose in the morning. He wasn't too concerned about the goose at that point because he had managed to injure it, but he was curious to see where it had gone. So the next day John would head back out to search for the goose and he brought several companions with him to help him search. During their search they passed a log house where an elderly woman was living, a woman named Mrs. Buchanan, the same woman who had been hassling the family about buying the property years earlier. When they saw her, she was sitting on her front porch and appeared to be very agitated. As soon as she saw them, she glared at John with eyes filled with contempt. But what John thought was most interesting was the fact that she seemed to be nursing a badly injured arm. Quickly putting two and two together, John gave the woman a sharp glare, held up his rifle, and then returned to his farm. He was now confident that he had made his point, and that the score had been settled at last, and that the family would now be left alone. And he ended up being correct. Nothing more happened on the farm after this. There were no disturbances of any kind, and life at the McDonald homestead had finally returned to normal. Forty years after the alleged Baldoon mystery, the youngest son of John McDonald, Neil McDonald, wrote a book detailing his family's experiences. He interviewed 26 older local villagers who all claimed to have witnessed these strange events. The book would be published under the title The Baldoon Mystery, an intriguing story of witchcraft near Wallaceburg, Ontario. For those who believed in the paranormal, this book was a fascinating read and the story has continued to circulate well into the 20th and the 21st centuries. Of course, there's also been a lot of skepticism regarding this story. The family being so willing to profit off of curious visitors to their haunted house have led many to conclude that this entire thing was nothing but a hoax. A scam made up of greedy opportunists seeking fame and fortune. Whatever the truth is, the Baldoon mystery has become one of Ontario's most famous ghost stories. And if nothing else, it is a good story. <laughs>